Well, to anybody listening, hello, and welcome to my presentation on infrastructure and city design philosophy. In this presentation, I'm essentially going to cover the issue with United States infrastructure and city design, and then make a comparison with other city design and infrastructure philosophies from other countries such as uh, Europe, mainly the Netherlands, and Germany, along with some Eastern countries such as Japan. As this pertains to the course, my what if is, what if we build cities around the human being rather than economic structures? Of course, this implies my what is, is that currently cities are built around economic structures and not human beings, making them inhumane. My what now is mainly going to be discussing how can we approach this issue, what can be done to make a city more humane and more designed for a human being. And are there currently cities built for humans that already exist? What are they doing different? Let's go ahead and begin. The United States, of course, is considered a capitalistic country. Everything here is fiscally motivated. And culturally, we tend to lean towards the individual rather than the collective. I'm not saying this is the wrong way to approach anything. There is no obvious, blatant, better system. But what I am saying is that a capitalistic approach to society will impact the aspects of everyday life. Let's talk about rails. When the question of road reliance in the United States comes up, I always like to bring up LA. Los Angeles, at one point in time, had the biggest and most extensive system of light rails in the world, even surpassing the Netherlands and Germany. This, of course, was in the early 20th century, and cars are slowly becoming more and more accessible to the average person, although still expensive. The railway lines conveniently got bought up by a child company owned by General Motors. After this, we start seeing the light rail systems being decommissioned and dismantled in favor for the car. Roads were built over rails, and lanes kept being added. Now, this was particularly beneficial to General Motors, because now everyone in the LA area was forced to essentially buy a car to get anywhere, because the only infrastructure that was available now was roads and cars. Rails were conveniently no longer an option. Essentially now, you have a large urban area that is completely reliant on your cars and fuel. This is what we call a captive consumer base. And that is my first point in this critical project of economic favoritism over quality of life. And of course, I'm going to be detailing the American concept of the open road and the freedom of the road. You can go wherever you want, whenever you want, with your own personal car. But in modern day, does a car really grant you freedom? What exactly is freedom? I'm going to be making that connection with our declaration, along with some other philosophical things that Alan had brought up. Cities are densely populated. If you live in a city, you live with a lot of other people. You live essentially with a community. Now, in a country that's so individualistic, how does this compare? There's a lot of really fantastic connections that I can make with One Straw Revolution, which I'll be talking about. But I can also make some connections with, like I stated earlier, countries like Japan. And also countries in Europe. An important connection I'm going to make with One Straw Revolution is the concept of our understanding of nature. If our living environment is what we consider too unnatural, this can be unhealthy and inhumane. What if it was a little more natural? How do we define that? Another key point I'm going to be talking about in this critical project is the concept of future and building for the future, or lack thereof. It's human nature to be wrong, and maybe we miscalculated something in regards to infrastructure and city design. If we are going to improve our current design philosophies, we first have to change them and admit that we are wrong and understand what reinforces the current philosophies. This can be something like groupthink, which was mentioned in that book. I, of course, will also be talking about what makes a city humane rather than inhumane. Something that I want to study and look more into in writing this project is beauty as it pertains to a city. How does a culture rub off on the architecture? What's the historical background on it? Speaking of history, that plays a very important part in this critical project. I'm going to be talking a lot about technological development and how that impacts cities and infrastructure. I'm also going to be looking into psychology as it pertains to this as well, and I'll be putting it into anthropological context. So, let's recap what I said in case you fell asleep. What is? Cities and infrastructure currently in the United States are what I would consider inhumanely built. What if? What if we built them humanely? What if we built them around the human being? What now? How do we approach this? What can we do differently to get a humanely built city? What are other countries doing to where they get humanely built cities? What are the steps the United States needs
needs to take to get here. The main points I'm going to be touching on is, like I said, economic favoritism, economic systems, and how they impact the design. The next one is also going to be anthropological and cultural impacts on the design. The philosophies on community and communal living, living with other people. I'm also going to be talking about the impacts of technological developments and the history of technological developments as it pertains to the United States, and how this in turn impacted our design of cities and infrastructure. For example, the invention of the steam locomotive, the telegraph, the radio, the automobile, and so on. I'll be viewing all these through the disciplinary lenses and context of anthropology, history, economics, and psychology. Of course, I'll touch on other disciplines as well, but these are the primary ones I'll be using. And that's pretty much it. I apologize for not using a pop filter, and I thank you very much for listening. Goodbye.